Welcome, everyone. My name is Lisa Brown. I'm the executive director of ACS, and we are thrilled to um, be hosting today's program four weeks out from the national election. Obviously, there is no better time to be holding a program on protecting the vote, a national conversation on voting rights in the 2008 election. This is the first um, internet simulcast of an ACS program, and we are really excited that technology is permitting us to host a truly national program in which all of our chapters are able to be engaged in the program. And we have over two dozen chapters. Um, welcome to all of you out there engaging in this program, participating in it, and then also many of them are going to be hosting their own discussions following this program. So this is really exciting to us. And the strong response from our chapters is evidence of the terrific work that ACS members are doing out there to build vibrant chapters that are engaged in real world issues. So I want to say a personal thank you to all of the chapter members that have worked so hard to make this terrific program possible. Needless to say, voting issues are at the forefront of everyone's mind right now, four weeks out from the presidential election. This election has re-engaged people young and old in our democracy, and we have seen new voter registrations in states across the country, including a number of registrations, increased registrations by students. But there are concerns that some voters, particularly first-time voters, are going to be disenfranchised either by legal or administrative hurdles or by more outright deception or intimidation. And we have a spectacular panel of experts with us here today um, to discuss the key voting rights issues that we are seeing in this election cycle. The panelists are going to focus on problems that threaten to disenfranchise particularly vulnerable communities and what each of us can do to go about protecting the fundamental right to vote. Um, and we're not just going to identify issues and talk about them. Um, we're also going to tell you about how you can get personally involved in protecting the right to vote in your community. So after this terrific panel discussion, um, there's going to be a conversation about volunteer opportunities for lawyers and law students. As many of you know, we have been working with the nonpartisan election protection coalition to engage our members in election protection work. And we're going to talk to you about specific ways that each one of you can get involved in this incredibly important effort. Um, before I begin, um, I want to remind our viewers that you can participate in this um, program by emailing questions to the panelists to protect the vote at acslaw.org. Protect the vote at acslaw.org. We really hope you'll submit questions and we look forward to hearing from you. So I now want to turn things over to Dahlia Lithwick, who is senior editor and legal correspondent for Slate, who is going to guide us through this conversation. I'm sure most of you are already familiar with, Dahlia, with Dahlia's cogent and insightful not to mention humorous, which is not a word you typically hear with regard to legal issues, um, her humorous analysis of legal issues. We're thrilled to have her as our moderator today. Dahlia. Thank you, Lisa, and uh, thank you all for being here. It's, uh, it's just a great honor to be invited uh, to be involved with, with this event, and really very humbling to be on, on this particular panel. These are folks who, who actually know stuff. Uh, a lot more stuff than I do, so I'm going to uh, quickly introduce them. Uh, and I want to welcome those of you who are joining us uh, in, out in the world in cyberspace uh, and <laughs> encourage you to send in questions. I already have a sheaf of questions that folks have sent in, and uh, we're going to try to get through them as quick as we can. Um, just by way of a brief precatory uh, observation, I was at a, an election event two weeks ago where uh, somebody was talking about the election and he talked for an hour and a half about polls and about polling and about states and swing states and blue states and red states. And then I put my hand up at the end and said, uh, idiot lawyer that I am, well, but what about vote caging and what about voter ID and what about vote suppression? And he rolled his eyes in the manner of somebody talking to a very small, very frail, not very bright kid and said, well, that's somebody else's problem. Uh, it's just not seemingly the problem of people thinking about this election in the horse race sense to think about not so much the voting, but whether voting, votes are going to get counted. And so I'm delighted uh, to be involved in a conversation with people for whom it is their problem, uh, because ultimately, as we all know, it's all of our problem. This is how elections get decided. So I'm going to 
proceed as follows. I'm going to introduce you to the three panelists uh, sitting next to me. They're each going to give five very brief opening statements about their particular areas of, of expertise, and then we're going to open it up for about 25 minutes of discussion, a more free-ranging discussion about the various other problems that they may not get to touch on in their opening remarks. Uh, that said, seated at my right, and uh, the person who will speak first is Kristen Clark, Assistant Counsel in the Political Participation Group, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Kristen is co-director of the Political Participation Group at, group at the NAAC Legal Defense and Education Fund, Inc., where she oversees and coordinates the activities of the organization's legal program in the areas of voting rights and election law. Kristen has worked for several years in the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice before that. Uh, and her book, Seeking Higher Ground, The Hurricane Katrina Crisis, Race and Public Policy Reader, was released by Palgrave Macmillan in December of 2007. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you. And I want to thank a, uh, the ACS for hosting this very, very important event. Um, voter suppression and intimidation tactics are alive and well this election cycle, and so I'm here this afternoon to really underscore um, that, that theme. Many of the incidents that we're hearing about this election cycle are ones that are, are very much targeted at specific communities. They're targeted at African American voters, Latinos, poor voters, student voters, and other vulnerable groups. The schemes we're finding are often aimed at locking out certain voices from the political process. And historically, what we know about voter intimidation and suppression schemes is that they, they often appear, rear their ugly head, at moments uh, where we're seeing hotly contested elections between a minority and a non-minority candidate. So to some extent, it's not surprising that we're seeing the proliferation of many of these tactics uh, at this particular moment. So what I'd like to do is t uh, three things. I want to highlight some of the most egregious incidents that we're seeing this election cycle, uh, talk about their impact, their potential impact, and then outline some suggestions, thoughts on what we can do to prevent these incidents from uh, impairing access to the political process in November. Uh, so what are we seeing around the country? In Macomb County, Michigan, as some of you might know, Republican Party officials recently announced plans to use foreclosure lists to challenge voter eligibility at the polls. So what's problematic about this? Well, what we know is that in the state of Michigan, 61% of persons who are the recipients of subprime loans are African Americans. We know that uh, minorities, racial minorities, are disproportionately the ones entangled in the current foreclosure crisis. So any plan to use foreclosure lists is, uh, one, uh, illegitimate, uh, doesn't mean that the voter no longer resides in their home, uh, and two, uh, it's a plan that would certainly have a stark burden on minority voters. We're very concerned about this. We're concerned about copycat schemes that may emerge elsewhere in the country. And uh, just le yesterday learned that there are some rumblings in Indianapolis where officials may undertake a similar scheme. Uh, we're also hearing about plans for caging this election cycle. So what is caging? Caging is essentially when individuals or groups send out mass mailings to a targeted community. The mailings are sent out by non-forwardable mail or by registered mail. And any mail that's ultimately not delivered is used to compile a list or directory of persons who are uh, presumed to no longer reside in that address. The lists are then used to challenge voters' eligibility to cast an absentee ballot, to participate in early voting, uh, to cast a ballot directly at the polls on Election Day. Caging uh, is a scheme that we saw in Florida during the last presidential election cycle, and we're seeing some evidence of, of caging schemes pop up in the, uh, around the country now. Another issue we're very concerned about, false and misleading information, deceptive practices is also a very big issue that we're contending with. Uh, false uh, leaflets are being distributed in communities that advertise the wrong information about the time, date, location for voting. We've seen flyers in the past that say Democrats uh, vote on Wednesday, Republicans vote on Tuesday. Um, we, we're now hearing reports out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, that there are flyers being distributed at Drexel University and in surrounding black neighborhoods, warning that if you turn out to vote on Election Day and, and have an outstanding traffic 
uh, citation or a warrant that you could be subject to arrest. These flyers uh, have false information and uh, are, are specifically aimed at locking certain voters out of the, out of the process, and they're problematic and we're concerned about them. Uh, another big issue that we're, uh, uh, that's on the radar is law enforcement presence at polling sites. This, this historically has been a big issue. In the 2006 election cycle, MALDEF attorneys witnessed anti-immigrant uh, activists aggressively intimidating Latino voters in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, uh, in the past, we've seen police set up speed traps and police barricades for the specific purpose of discouraging and deterring minority voter turnout. Uh, so this is a, another thing that's uh, currently on the radar and certainly something that could suppress the vote in November. Um, racial slurs, outright violence, not unheard of in this day and age. Uh, in the 2006 election cycle, election cycle, there was a cross burning in Grand Coteau, Louisiana, aimed at locking out black voters from the polls. Uh, and most recently in Louisiana, we're hearing about candidates using racial slurs or, or making statements aimed at discouraging uh, black voters from turning out uh, to the polls. Uh, a final point uh, or incident that I want to uh, make sure is on the radar is selective prosecutions of minority voters and minority vote activists. This was a big problem during the 2006 election cycle, and I want to highlight one particular incident out of Texas. In 2006, the Texas State Attorney General uh, went on a campaign, waged a campaign against black activists who were leading get-out-the-vote efforts, encouraging elderly and disabled voters to vote by absentee ballot. He brought 13 prosecutions, 12 of them against persons who were black or Latino, all elderly uh, women who were going out and, and providing assistance to persons who, who could not physically make it out to the polls, people who wanted to participate. He charged them with providing illegal assistance in the, uh, the mailing of those absentee ballots. So selective prosecutions is another tactic um, that we've seen in the past and that we're concerned about this election cycle. So that's just kind of a sampling of some of what we're seeing, certainly not everything. What can we do about it? There's certainly state and federal statutes at our disposal that reach uh, some of these intimidating uh, schemes. Section 11B of the Voting Rights Act is, is one such provision that prohibits intimidation at the <laughs> polls, and unfortunately it's only been used three times um, uh, since the act was passed in 1965. Section 1971B of the Civil Rights Act of 1957, also another federal statute that prohibits this kind of conduct. And a number of states, but not all, have statutes that prohibit voter intimidation. And what can you do? Uh, I think it's really important that you find ways to get engaged in election monitoring uh, efforts and voter protection programs, more of which you'll hear about later on in the program. I think it's really important that we get good volunteers out on the ground to document these incidents uh, because they're important and they're stories that need to be told. Uh, so, so to the extent that you, you hear about something in your community, document it and report it. And write op-eds discouraging this kind of activity in your community. And um, think about ways that you can get engaged in some of the, the legal efforts that are being waged. We need help from you all preparing pleadings so that we're poised and ready on election day should we need to turn to the courts to provide uh, relief for voters who uh, are faced with some of these uh, suppression schemes at the polls. Uh, I think the challenge for us is figuring out how to engage the tens of thousands of newly uh, registered voters will be per participating for the very first time this election cycle. We want to make sure that they're not turned off by the intimidation and suppression that may happen and uh, figure out how we restore confidence in the political process because the memories of uh, problems we faced in 2000 and 2004 are not far behind us. So thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Kristen. Our next speaker is Nina Perales. Southwest Regional Council for the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund. In that role, Nina directs MALDEF's litigation, advocacy, and public education in Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, and six additional southern and western states. She specializes in voting rights litigation, including redistricting and vote dilution challenges. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And thank you to ACS and to American University for having me out from San Antonio, Texas to talk to you about some of these issues. Uh, the legal issues that affect voters this year uh, also include broad laws that require additional documents to either register to vote or to cast a ballot at the polls on election day. Some of these laws are known as voter ID laws. Others, uh, which we're particularly focused on, are called proof of citizenship laws. The Supreme Court this past term upheld Indiana's voter ID law. Georgia's voter ID law is currently on appeal to the 11th Circuit after it was upheld by the District Court. And in my case, Gonzalez versus Arizona, we challenged the Arizona voter ID law and proof of citizenship law. This case is on appeal to the 9th Circuit after the District Court upheld it this summer. The impact of voter ID and proof of citizenship laws is serious and measurable. We had, I guess, the, the privilege of being able to gather a lot of information about ballots being cast and registrations <coughs> being rejected as part of our litigation in the Arizona case. And so we were able to get the pieces of paper themselves that relate to real individuals. So over the three elections that were a part of our case, the 2006 primary, the 2006 general, and the 2008 presidential preference election in Arizona, which is their version of um, Super Tuesday. In terms of voters who uh, did not cast ballots because of voter ID, the number was between four and 5,000. These are folks who went to the polls and cast a special kind of ballot for somebody who could not show ID and then did not return with sufficient ID. And so those ballots went uncounted. They were then put in vaults in counties around the, uh, the state and then drawn back out through various legal machinations for us to be able to do our case. And you're thinking to yourself, wow, you know, who's so disengaged that they don't have ID? But it's, it's more subtle than that. In Arizona, your ID address has to match your voter registration address. So I always like to ask, is there anybody here who has a valid ID that they would normally use to prove who they were, but whose address on the ID does not match your voter registration address? If you're nodding your head, you might have some problems voting in Arizona. So it's just something to keep in mind. We also looked at how many people were unable to register to vote because they did not provide additional documentation related to citizenship. That number was 38,000 rejected voter registration forms. I think in any state, 38,000 rejected voter registration forms is a really high number. We did an analysis of them and found that they represented about 31,000 individuals because some people had applied twice and been rejected twice for inability to provide the kind of document that uh, the state wanted to prove citizenship, including our lead plaintiff, Mr. Gonzalez. So of the about 31,000 individuals that got rejected, about 10,000 cured, meaning they made a subsequent uh, good application and were accepted to the roles. Two-thirds did not. So that's about 20,000 people who took the time to register to vote, fill out the form, sign it, put everything just the way it's <laughs> supposed to be, except for the part about the additional proof of citizenship. That's not a, a great rate, and it's a, it's a pretty big impact because that represents about 20,000 people. Large-scale systematic efforts to restrict the electorate, like voter ID and proof of citizenship laws, are also accompanied by the kinds of smaller efforts that Kristen was referring to, to mislead or intimidate voters. A couple of examples from our area, or things that Maldiv has, has come across, include letters that were sent to Latino voters in Orange County, California, telling them that if they were immigrants, they could not vote, that it was a crime to vote if you're an immigrant. Now, anybody here who's naturalized knows you can be an immigrant and a United States citizen at the same time. And in the letter, you know, talked a lot about criminal penalties and was very threatening and was in Spanish, um, and it was a big to-do. And eventually the person who sent them was indicted, not for sending the letters themselves, but for lying about it during the investigation. We also had flyers distributed in Fort Worth, Texas, in Tarrant County, uh, that were bilingual, that were uh, distributed throughout a Latino area, a Latino neighborhood during a racially contested election, during the ramp up to the election, 
that looked very official. They had the Tarrant County seal on them. They also had the logo of Southwest Voter Registration, which is a civil rights organization. It had a slogan in Spanish, su voto es su voz, which is, you know, your vote is your voice, which is a civil rights slogan. And it looked very proper and wonderful, except, of course, it had the wrong date to go and vote. So it was encouraging people to go out and vote on Saturday when the election was really on Tuesday. And then finally, the, the reference that Kristen made to the polling place in Tucson, Arizona, where we encountered um, armed vigilantes who were intercepting Latino voters as they approached the polling place. What I have to tell you is that we weren't there looking for armed vigilantes. We were there looking for problems with voter ID and just happened to have an attorney at the polling place when coincidentally the, the armed vigilantes turned up. And they had a, like a system. One guy had a clipboard and he would rush up and intercept the Latino voter and insist that the person pay attention to what was on the clipboard. It was a petition or something like that. The second guy ran up with a video camera and put it really close to the voter's face, right there, right off the side. And then the third guy was the one with the gun and he would stand on the other side. So it would make like a triangle trap for the voters, um, many of whom were deterred and none of whom wanted to talk to us because it was, you know, at that point, like other people were chasing them too. Wait, wait, you've been intimidated. Come back and give us a statement. Right? <laughs> so, it was not a great day for the voters at that polling place, I'll tell you that. Uh, and then finally, uh, I know it's tough sometimes. Uh, finally, I wanted to mention, um, because of all of these things, and also because of the high likelihood that there will continue to be either misleading or intimidating tactics, we do uh, have a election protection project, which we'll be doing specifically, my office will be doing in Texas, <coughs> New Mexico, and Colorado. We'll be deploying a rapid response teams of both attorneys and law students in these areas. So if anybody here is planning to spend Election Day in New Mexico, Colorado, or Texas, or anybody out in our cyber audience is with a school that's in one of those areas, please give me a yell, send me an email, and perales at maldef.org. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Uh, our last panelist is Wendy Weiser. She's the Deputy Director for Democracy at the Brennan Center for Justice. She directs the Brennan Center's work on voting rights and elections, and that work ranges from litigation to advocacy to scholarship on these issues. Uh, Wendy's an adjunct professor at NYU Law School. Welcome, Wendy. Well, thank you, and it's, it's great to be here and to, um, and to work with ACS and American University again. Um, I'm going to try and cover um, two um, broad topics. Um, one is uh, student um, voting issues, and the other is sort of the range of barriers to voting that we've seen um, crop up in state laws across the country um, in, in brief. Um, and I wanted to start by noting that yesterday, for, for many of you, was the deadline for registering to vote, either in your school or your original home communities. I, I hope everybody did get to register to vote. For, for many of you, there is still time. There are shorter registration deadlines. And if you haven't done so, I, I urge you to do so quickly. Um, but for many students across the country, unfortunately, have been experiencing needless and sometimes um, illegal um, barriers to their voter registration, and many others are likely to face additional hurdles um, between now and the time that they attempt to vote. And um, I, I say this not to discourage you. Um, I, if someone tells you that you cannot register or vote, um, either at school or at home, um, chances are that they're incorrect and, and that there are options available for you. Um, there is actually a 50-state student voting guide on the Brennan Center's website which should provide you all of the information you need. But if you have any problem, you should contact the Election Protection Hotline. Um, but I, I do want to talk through some of these barriers that, that we've been seeing because you can do something about it to help prevent other students in your communities from going through this. And this is something that we see time and time again and it's really time to put an end to. So um, first, um, there are a number, and it's actually a small number of states that actually do have some strong legal barriers to student voting. Um, for example, um, Idaho and Tennessee have very strict residency requirements for, um, for uh, voting 
so that if a student doesn't intend to stay there after graduation, they can establish um, voting residency in that state. And then, you know, the, the, this may or may not um, be constitutional, but this could create a problem for a student who um, might be in school in Tennessee, have accepted a job in Washington, D.C. after graduation, knows that they're leaving, and, and whose parents no longer live where they originally grew up. They, that student might have absolutely nowhere to vote under these rules. Um, now, in, in other states, there, there are not as strict barriers, but there are rules that are susceptible to interpretations that could create barriers. Um, and they're also susceptible for voter friendly and we believe more constitutional interpretations that allow students to register and vote. But we're seeing, um, you know, occasionally a tightening of um, the application of those rules. And Indiana, for example, is one place where the, there really shouldn't be a problem establishing residency in your school community. But the Secretary of State has been issuing very um, scary um, and strict interpretations on its website um, you know, that, that has been actually intimidating um, and dissuading to a number of students. But, you know, for most states, though, there, there are actually no legal barriers to establishing voting residency. Students should be able to register to vote either in their original home communities or in their school communities. But there is widespread misinformation, not only among the general public, the campaigns, but among election officials themselves about student voting rights. And that's something, the reason why you should educate yourselves. And, and in addition to the misinformation that exists, there's also a bias in some cases against student voters um, based on a perception that they they're not really residents of these communities, they're temporary residents, and, and that's a bias that sometimes affects their decision making and that creates additional burdens for students. So we're seeing um, in some counties in Virginia and Colorado, we've been seeing um, students not being registered to vote if they give a dorm address, and that's actually not, um, not legally um, a, a permissible reason to deny somebody registration. You, uh, a dorm room can be a residence just like a, a homeless shelter can. Um, you know, we've seen them uh, requiring additional forms from students who are trying to register to vote. Again, that's something that should not be legally required. We're also seeing misleading and intimidating information, even from election officials, but also from uh, political operatives that are suggesting that there could be negative consequences that students might um, face if they register to vote, um, especially in their school communities. Again, that is usually false. Um, we've seen in, in Virginia, for example, there was a very widely publicized incident of a, a local election official telling students and issuing a, a, a memorandum saying that if you register to vote in the state, your parents may not be able to claim you as dependents. You may lose your financial aid or scholarship. You know, that is not true. That is not true. For in the you know, vast, vast, vast majority of cases unless there is some special local scholarship, which is a very rare thing in, in only a few jurisdictions. You know, so those are some of the barriers and that, that we've been seeing to date, but it's not ending. Right now, students are also facing an increased risk of challenges by political operatives, either based on caging operations or, or for um, you know, the same kinds of biases that, are, that have been plaguing them in the registration process. Um, in the primaries, there was a, a blanket challenge um, to about 900 um, students in, in Georgia and Statesboro that um, the election protection folks were actually able to resolve, but this was just a blanket challenge saying you're not residents, um, and, and that was, uh, and those um, students had to vote provisional ballots, which were luckily counted. We just saw um, last week um, the Republican Party of Montana has just issued 6,000 challenges to um, based on changes of address. The vast majority of those are either service members who've had their mail forwarded to them in Iraq or, or elsewhere around the world, or, or students who've actually, you know, people who are from Montana but are going to school out of state who are still eligible to vote in Montana. And we expect to see similar kinds of challenges at the polls, and this is something that we can actually protect against now, and we should certainly vigil be vigilant against um, on election day. You know, and the, the result has been that there are students that have been dissuaded from registering and voting in their states and that that's, um, that shouldn't happen and you should um, get assistance and take steps to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. I, this is um, all the barriers we've been hearing about is, is part of a, a broader movement that we've been seeing over the past couple of years. And I just wanted to briefly note that we've really been seeing an increase in the number of legal barriers to voter registration and voting um, since 2000, and really especially in the past four years um, across the states. 
And so that in a lot of jurisdictions, we now have a virtual obstacle course for many voters that typically affects certain groups, the groups we've been talking about here, much more than other voters. And barriers from voter registration access, it's not being made available as required by law at social service agencies, so people who are disproportionately poor people that use those communities and people with disabilities. Even the Department of Veterans Affairs has been widely publicized, has not been allowing voter registration services to its patients in its facilities, which is rather shocking and unconscionable. There is an increase in technical barriers to processing voter registration forms in Florida and a number of other states. They're not processing forms where you don't check off these redundant boxes on the form saying that you're a citizen and over 18, even though later on the form you swear to your birth date and to the fact that you're an eligible citizen. Again, this is, the courts have not blocked that, and we even saw a similar thing with absentee ballot requests in Ohio, just denied based on a technicality. We're seeing these matching, these computer matching barriers. There's at least four states right now that are rejecting voter registration applications if they don't pass an electronic matching process that actually is highly error prone and fails about 20 percent of the time. We've been litigating against this in various states across the country. Florida just implemented this on September 8th, really in the height of the voter registration season, and they've already had thousands and thousands of non-matches, and as they've been going through, they've found that so far 75 percent of the ones, and they haven't even gone through clearing them, that they've found have just been typos. But this could really disenfranchise huge numbers of people, and if they can't actually correct these errors before Election Day, as is likely the case with the huge flood of applications that are coming in now, this could have a huge impact. And there are lawsuits in both Ohio and Wisconsin trying to force this through at the last minute retroactively that could really affect people. Purges, we're seeing sweeping purges without notice that are secretive, that are, and that are really error prone and prone to manipulation. You know, the caging we've heard about and the challenges, and then you go through voter ID when you get to the poll and voter intimidation when you get there, and this is not to mention the ballot design and the voting machine problems. So we're seeing a real obstacle course to voting, and much of which is enshrined in law and policy, much more so than we have in recent years, and they're increasing efforts to step this up, and we need to stay vigilant to keep our elections fair and open to all. Thank you, Wendy. I want to just start by clarifying who the they are in this conversation, because we're hearing about things that range from, you know, systemic, the Texas Attorney General, to, you know, nut jobs running around with guns. And so I wonder if we can try to kind of circumscribe the scope of who they are, how much of this is systemic. I know that that's a very hard thing to answer, but I think it helps a little bit for us to understand what the problem is if we understand whether caging is happening in some quasi-official way or caging is happening by, you know, cranks. And I think that, you know, I'm not asking you to go through all of these issues, but I think if you could help us understand which parts of this are very systemic and very, very rigorously being applied in some very, very pre-planned way, and which parts of this are, you know, the inevitable zealotry of people who want to intimidate voters. I don't know if somebody wants to take a crack at it. Well, you know, the caging and challenge practices that we're seeing inside the polling places, you can often tie to the party officials. In most states, the only ones who are permitted to be stationed inside polling places, aside from the poll workers, are poll watchers serving on behalf of the candidates. And so it's often the political parties that are behind these efforts to cage, to implement caging schemes, or to aggressively challenge folks inside the polls, which raises an important issue. Unfortunately, a lot of states have laws that permit, to some extent, challenging of voters inside the polls. And this is an incredibly problematic issue and an increasingly an issue in our elections. A lot of the state laws that permit challenges don't clarify what the burden of proof 
is. So it's unclear what evidence, what amount of evidence the challenger needs to present to successfully prove to poll workers that somebody's not ineligible voters. So what you're seeing is just a, a tremendously kind of haphazard approach. Uh, you know, the poll workers will just kind of get together, and if a majority of them agree in most instances that the challenger met their, their burden, then the, the voters prohibited from voting. Um, I think that after this election cycle, it's really time to maybe revisit some of these uh, laws that permit challenging to, to clarify um, what the, the burden of proof is. But just to get back to your question, I mean, I think when, when we're talking about caging and challenging, we tend to, to be talking about the, about the parties there. But it's always, I think, a, a mix of individuals involved in these schemes, be they uh, elected officials, uh, ruthless, heartless individuals, um, and, and, you know, attorney generals and so forth. I wanted to add or, or, or focus more on the systemic problems. Uh, political party officials are going to try and figure out ways to game the system to make sure that um, life's easier for their voters and that the other side's voters aren't likely to vote. And what we need to have is a system that doesn't allow that to happen, that actually protects the voters. So we not only don't have sufficient voter protections against things like challenges and caging, but we actually now have a system that weighs in and, and knocks out voters I itself. And, we're, and that's one thing that we're seeing more and more of. We're, we're seeing less voter protections and more barriers that are actually coming from state laws and procedures. And so I, I, I would put the bigger part of the blame on, on the, our, our insufficiently protective election system right now. The only other thing I would add with respect to systemic barriers is that putting aside election officials, um, there are also conservatives who are part of a, a movement to respond to the changing demographics of the electorate, whether it's in particular states like Texas and Arizona or whether it's national. And, you know, coming from the Latino perspective, we're a fast-growing population. We have a lot of kids who are being born in the United States who are citizens who are turning 18 now. And I think that there's a lot of fear and trepidation about these transformations in the electorate. And so a few years ago, we started seeing um, a coordinated attempt to introduce voter ID legislation in state legislatures around the country. And there were conservative think tanks that were drafting model legislation for voter ID. And there were people writing and talking quite a bit about the concept of voter fraud or the idea that either non-citizens were fraudulently registering to vote or people were fraudulently registering their dogs, their cats, their potted plants in order to vote them. Now, mind you, voter ID is about in-person voting at the polls. So I will give money to anybody who can get their cat to successfully cast a vote in the polls on election day. But <laughs> aside from specific election officials, I think that there is a broader movement around putting the brakes on the changes that we're seeing in who is entering the electorate. And this is being done through so-called scholarly articles as well as through organizations that draft model legislation for states. That, um, your, your flick at um, vote fraud is a good segue to, the, to another question that, that I wanted to ask, which is about the role of the Justice Department in all this because presumably the, the Justice Department once was doing all this hard work of protecting uh, the right to vote. Uh, and I wondered if anyone wanted to talk briefly about uh, the extent to which the notion of uh, rampant vote fraud in America has sort of taken hold at the highest levels of government. Yeah, I think that there, you know, there is a role for the Department of Justice to play this November, and there have been many of us who have been uh, very much focused on this issue. The, there are federal civil rights laws that are at the um, disposal of the Justice Department. The Attorney General has primary enforcement responsibility in a lot of these areas. And we want to see the Justice Department intervening uh, where you're hearing about acts of intimidation and suppression, reminding the public uh, that, these, uh, that these acts violate the spirit of civil rights laws, that the Justice Department is there to, to fight and preserve voter access. We know that the Justice Department is going to deploy federal observers to many polling sites in November, but I think there are some things that they can do more proactively to complement that effort. 
uh, be they stepping in now to discourage and deter a lot of what they're seeing. I mean, when the Attorney General speaks, that's a voice that I think rings loud and clear and can have an important deterrent effect that's very necessary right now. And, uh, and when it comes down to Election Day, I think that we may very well see, see problems that are so egregious that it may require some group, and I hope that uh, where appropriate it's the Justice Department, turning to the courts for relief, turning to the courts to extend polling hours, for example, um, where there are problems that have uh, locked uh, voters out during the early hours of an Election Day, which is something that we see all the time. Unfortunately, this is a burden that has been leveled on the, uh, the civil rights community. Uh, but the Justice Department has far more uh, resources at its disposal and um, uh, weapons in its arsenal. And uh, I think that uh, we, we should make sure that we continue to talk about the important role that, that the Justice Department plays this election cycle. You know, the issue of voter fraud, um, and especially as it relates to the Department of Justice, has become so politicized and such a hot-button issue. It's been used as an excuse to um, pursue actually a partisan electoral agenda through using the Justice Department, using U.S. attorneys, using the voting section. It's been used to try and advance measures that suppress the vote. So. Um, it's unclear whether there's a, there's a serious concern there or whether it, it's been a, a strategic um, way of, of pursuing particular policy aims. But um, certainly between now and the election, the role of the Justice Department is not to pursue uh, allegations of voter fraud. This is right now, it, it should be focusing all of its efforts on protecting the vote, stopping voter intimidation, and any kinds of law enforcement steps um, should take place after the election, and at least that's what its rule book used to say um, before they recently uh, amended it to be consistent with their past violations of the rule book. So that, that leads to, to there's been such a, a strand under underlying what all of you have said, and that, that is the words election day. And one of the things that's so very hard about, about these issues is they arise on election day, and then everyone runs around with their hair on fire trying to solve a problem under this enormous ticking clock. And you know, probably the, the highest or lowest manifestation of that was the US Supreme Court trying to decide Bush v. Gore quickly and badly uh, because the clock is ticking. So I wonder if uh, any of you want to speak to, you know, how disadvantaged we are by the fact that these issues are happening on election day and then we're reacting with a sense that we've already lost uh, before we've even walked into a courtroom. Well, it's, it's really hard to do <laughs> litigation on election day. That's, in, that's much like closing the barn door after the horse is gone. Some small-scale cases can be effective. For example, if polling places don't open on time, if you can get into court in the morning and ask for a court order to hold the polling places open later in the day, that's been successful. Um, in Texas, we're going towards electronic voting, but back in the day when we had paper ballots, we would have places that would run out and counties that didn't order sufficient number of paper ballots. And so you may end up having to go to court regarding whether or not um, marked sample ballots, which are usually a totally different color of paper and look really different, but may have been given out to voters when the regular ballots are gone, are countable and how they can be counted. But this is, it's hard stuff to do and it gets harder the larger the scale is that you're trying to do this litigation on. I know that there's a lot of concern with increased turnout in this upcoming election, and we're particularly concerned about minority precincts where voter registration may have surged, and that there isn't necessarily um, folks at the county thinking about how to redistribute their electronic voting machines. And so some of this work can be done ahead of time to try to head off the worst if county officials are being pressured to think through the process by which they are distributing voting machines, that can be one way of trying to resolve the long lines that many people expect to see. Um, I just wanted to add that the Supreme Court has somewhat exacerbated this problem mm -hmm. that Nina was referencing of um, courts not necessarily being the most effective um, resolver of these kinds of issues because in the um, voter ID case, the Crawford case, mm -hmm. it um, issued a decision that is, has had the effect of 
making courts reluctant to decide cases that affect elections and voting rights in advance of elections until the damage has already been done, until there's a lot more evidence. Um, and, and this was um, – and this is really bad judicial policy. It's going to have a – we're going to see the impact of this in this upcoming election since a lot of these litigations, which could have resolved these problems long – a lot of problems long before the election will be bumped up right before and just after the election. So the one thing that I would add is that, you know, unfortunately a lot of states don't have plan Bs. They don't have contingency plans in place for when the machines malfunction, for when sufficient numbers of poll workers don't turn out on election day, for when the lines are extending around the building. Um, we, uh, uh, we know uh, about an incident in Virginia, for example, where they ran out of ballots during the presidential primary, resulting in long lines for uh, Democratic voters who were uh, 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 predominantly African American, and short lines for uh, white voters who tended to vote Republican in this pr uh, particular area. States need to have in, in place a plan B. Um, and I, I think that it's really important after this election cycle for states to, to go back to the drawing board and think about, you know, uh, in, instituting measures like paper ballot, some other option for when things go awry. But I, I also think that there's a little bit of a burden on the voter. We've got to make sure that voters go and do a little bit of homework in advance of Election Day, make sure that voters uh, verify their status on the registration rolls, verify the location of their polling place. I think that we can nip some of these problems in the bud um, if, if voters do some of that homework. And at the Legal Defense Fund, we've launched a Prepared to Vote program uh, PreparedToVote.org, uh, encouraging voters in a number of the deep south states and states with significant numbers of African American populations to do to do just that. And I encourage you to take that message to your your respective communities as well. Kristen, I'm so glad you mentioned voting machines because it gives me an opportunity to pull on my tinfoil hat <clears throat> and ask the question that you know is the question that worries so many. anybody who saw the. Bart uh, Homer Simpson tries to vote clip this week. If you haven't <laughs> seen it, you should race home and Google it. Um, but, you know, every time he touches the machine, it logs another vote for John McCain, even though he's trying to vote otherwise. Uh, and, and there's a lot of people who really think this election is over uh, because of, because of, of machines. And, and uh, those people are often called weird for having that view. I wonder if any of you want to talk about the issue of voting machines. Is, it, is this a real concern? And if it's a real concern, how are we going to find out what happened? And, and if something happened, what can be done? I'm happy to address that. Um, the, the Brennan Center actually um, did don a tinfoil hat as well and um, studied it in great detail with a team of computer scientists and cybersecurity experts, um, bipartisan. Um, the risks and, and threats of the uh, of all the um, electronic voting machines in use in the United States. This was about um, two years ago, and found significant security vulnerabilities with all of them, and had a series of recommendations um, in place. Um, that, that, and, and there was actually no steps that anyone was taking back then. Now, a, a significant number of states, almost all at this point, that, that use electronic voting machines have um, either by law required or, in fact, obtained um, um, paper records that voters can verify to, um, against the machine tallies, the prob against the vote that they cast in the machine. The, the problem is that almost no states are auditing those paper records. So the security benefit of having a, a, a paper trail is um, virtually nothing if you're not checking it against the voting machine totals, and, and that's not going on right now. Um, it is there, so if there's a prop questions are raised, it, it, it can be checked, um, but we, we don't really have good auditing and checking procedures in place, so I think that there are reasons for people to still be concerned. In addition to people's concerns, it's also important to, to weigh those concerns against the benefits that machines provide that can be a problem with paper ballots. And I mentioned running out of paper ballots. There's nothing more frustrating than being in a polling place that has to run out of paper ballots, and more specifically run out of Spanish language ballots, uh, mm -hmm. because then you can't just hand somebody an English language ballot. You're going to have to do a lot more than that. Machines never run out of Spanish language ballots, um, and so that's mm -hmm. an advantage. Machines also have headphones that you can plug into them that um, can assist blind voters 
who otherwise would have to bring somebody in to help them vote a paper ballot, and that violates the, the secrecy of the ballot. And then finally, some machines will prevent you from voting twice for the same office. You, you know, a machine is not going to let you vote for McCain and Obama in the presidential race, and sometimes people will mark paper ballots in a way where they're voting twice for the same office and it will void, void the vote. So I'm not putting a tinfoil hat, and, and, I, and I want to acknowledge all the concerns. They're very, very legitimate, and paper trails are super important. But there's also um, an importance. There are benefits that can be gained from machines if they're done right. Uh, so before we take questions, uh, now that you're all hopefully freaking out, um, we're lucky enough to have Jonah Goldman here from the National Campaign for Fair Elections. And Mir, I think is, Mira's going to introduce him. Thank you, Dahlia, and thank you to our fabulous panelists. Um, as Dahlia said, and one key question raised by this panel and partially addressed by this panel is, what, what can we do about all of this? And I'm pleased to say that there are a lot of great legal volunteer opportunities out there, um, some of which have been mentioned. One opportunity that we at ACS have been making our members aware of is through the Election Protection Coalition. And to tell us and all of you a little bit more about that is Jonah Goldman from the National Campaign for Fair Elections. Jonah? Thanks, Mira. And uh, so, so this is the beginning of the commercial portion of the, uh, of the event. Uh, I want to thank ACS, and it's great to be here, of course, with such good friends as always. Unfortunately, we're sort of always going around uh, the, the country talking about what this year is the gray lining on a really, really, really silver cloud of incredible participation, a new generation of, of political awareness, and I think that that's really incredible and really exciting. Uh, what I want to talk about for just a couple of minutes before we get to questions is uh, election protection, what we're doing, and uh, uh, the opportunities for all of you to participate. So like I said, we're sort of the commercial part of the, of the event here. Uh, election protection was started in 2001 as a result of what, you know, a couple of things happened down in Florida in 2000, and all of a sudden there was a lot of attention paid to all of the issues that we're talking about uh, as an opportunity to give voters a real-time, immediate help in getting through the polling place and getting through the, the voting process and casting a meaningful ballot. And basically what we did was we organized lawyers and law students to come together to educate themselves about what the laws are and what the rules are in the various different places and to figure out the best sort of delivery system for that information to the, to the voter because that, those two things are, are very different, of course, having lawyers doing a whole bunch of research and then actually getting something that people can understand. So we tried to figure out the best way to do that. And the way that we did that centers actually on the 866 Our Vote Hotline. And this year we run the 866 Our Vote Hotline. We're proud to run it with our, uh, with our colleagues at the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials who are running the 888 Bea Vota Hotline uh, for Spanish language callers. Uh, and basically what the hotline is, is, it, is by Election Day we'll have 750 simultaneous call stations in 25 different call centers across the country. So pretty much any place you are, we can use you as a volunteer. And those volunteers will be answering calls directly from voters. The call center is already up here in, here in Washington. We're already getting about, actually we're averaging over 1,000 calls a day from voters, which is both terrific in the sense that people are taking this seriously and preparing themselves now and not so terrific in the sense that those people don't have the information that they need already to get through the polling place. We're also doing live chatting where we're supplementing our, our hotline capabilities for our young voting, uh, our young voting partners and their constituencies. They're going to be chatting us questions on election day. We're going to be answering that. We need lawyers and law students to help us out with that. And then we're going to have about 45 uh, uh, 45 election protection legal committees across the country. These are places where lawyers are gathering together, being trained, being educated. They've been working for, for months now to work with election officials to solve some of these problems, and then they're going to be doing a field deployment on election day. Um, what's going on behind me? <laughs> um, a field deployment on election day where, uh, where voters will uh, uh, call into the hotline and then we'll be able to respond with people both at the polling place, with election officials. It really is, it's the largest, uh, um, it's, it, it, it's the largest effort of its kind. It's in fact the largest voter protection effort in the history of the country. And we really need this now to be able to do those sort of stopgap measures uh, on election day to make sure that voters do have that safety net. 
But of course, the other thing that we're doing, and the really important thing, and the last thing that I'll, that I'll say is that we're collecting data. We're illustrating the real problems that voters face from the perspective of the voters. We're communicating that to the media. We're communicating that to decision makers. So we can do what the job that we really, really need to do is. The job we really need to do isn't on November 4th. The job we really need to do is on November 5th. It's fixing these systems. It's getting rid of these arcane registration systems. It's making sure that we have machinery that we trust and that we can, that we can vote on. It's making sure we have enough poll workers. It's making sure we have enough resources. It's those sorts of things. And what we haven't been able to do yet and what we're doing better now, but what we'll certainly be able to do after November 4th, is really illustrate the types of problems voters face in an immediate localized way so we can go to, so we could go to decision makers and say these are the decisions uh, that you need to make to give a chance to all American voters to, to cast a meaningful ballot. So everybody, please sign up. If you, if you want to volunteer, sign up at www.866ourvote.org. If you have any questions, you can also call 866ourvote.org. We'd like to make that easy for you. So I'm sorry, just you don't call 866ourvote.org. You call just 866ourvote. But if you want to sign up, if you want to volunteer, there's also comprehensive information at 866ourvote.org. And uh, uh, thank you all for, for, for having me. Thanks to ACS for, for such uh, uh, great support over the years. And uh, I know now I'll turn it back over to Dahlia for the, uh, for the question period. Thank you, Jonah. Uh, you all have lasted much longer than your sandwiches. And uh, so if anybody has a question for either the whole panel or one panelist, and then I've got a stack of questions that have come in off the internet. So does anyone want to kick it off? Uh, can you say something about provisional voting? When it's available, is it pretty universal? Provisional ballots are, um, and I'll, I'll let you wrap up, are, are, are supposed to be offered during federal elections. And they're supposed to be offered to those voters who believe that they are eligible and that their name should be on the rolls, but for whatever reason, poll workers can't find them. The um, unfortunate thing with provisional ballots is that there tend to be very high rejection rates. Um, what happens with them is after the election, local officials convene, uh, look at their master lists, work with state election officials to, de to determine whether or not you were eligible, and sometimes your name's not there. Uh, some states require that you be in the right precinct uh, in order to cast that ballot. So you may have, and you often, it is the case, that poll workers will misdirect voters, send you to the wrong place, the voter gives up and says, look, darn it, I just want to cast uh, a provisional ballot, and uh, unfortunately, unless that voter were in the right precinct, um, that ballot's not going to count. Um, uh, this past Saturday, there was a congressional primary in Louisiana, and uh, they forgot to make provisional ballots available to the polls. So for the first several hours of the election, voters uh, who turned out believed themselves to be registered, poll workers couldn't find their name, they, they were turned away without the opportunity to, to cast a provisional ballot. For all of the problems with provisional ballots, ultimately they're supposed to be a, a safeguard of sorts. Uh, you know, poll workers screw things up sometimes. Um, uh, they'll, they'll glean over the list and may miss your name. The provisional ballot really is supposed to be an important safeguard in our, fred our federal elections, and, and unfortunately it's uh, been a process that's been riddled with problems that I know Wendy will elaborate. Yeah. I just wanted to make two points about it. One is a provisional ballot is a ballot of last resort. If, the, if somebody is trying to say that you should vote by provisional ballot and you think that you're entitled to vote by regular ballot, you should try and resolve that wherever possible and try to get to vote by regular ballot for a, because of the lower likelihood that it will count. That said, Anybody is entitled to a provisional ballot. There should be provisional ballots at every polling place. So if for some reason someone is trying to turn somebody away without giving them a ballot um, in a federal election, that is not allowed under federal law. So th those are, the, I think, two strong points uh, as the last resort. People should get a provisional ballot. Um, it's the Help America Vote Act of 2002. Um, 42 USC 15, uh, 15 uh, 482, <laughs> 15382, I believe it is. The, um, the issue with provisional ballots, they came in in 2002, right, with HAVA? 
how those 2002 and there's been a lot of poll workers who still haven't completely caught up with the idea of provisional ballots we've seen more instances of people not being offered a provisional ballot if their name does not appear on the rolls as opposed to being given one when they shouldn't um, most often we have seen people simply told you're not on the rolls go away um, and then they're just they never get to cast that ballot and it, it reminds us all that election day is this one time, you know, especially in a presidential, one time every four years. It's like putting on the Academy Awards with no rehearsal. And, and using all the crew is like people you randomly recruited off the street. There's so little training. And, you know, they roll these machines out off the backs of trucks and they line them up and they expect them to work. Um, things happen on election day and poll workers are just regular people. And sometimes they're not completely sure how to administer the system. And it's all like showtime, you know, there's not a lot of time to, to get information and straighten it out. I have a, a, a couple of questions from people um, on the same topic, which is, uh, have there been any progress to protect the rights of elderly voters? Uh, so, so a lot of people are worried about their, their grandparents' rights to vote. Has there, are there particular issues? We haven't really talked about the elderly today, but are there particular issues and are there particular things that we can be doing to help them vote? You know, um, I want to point out one problem here that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about, but mandatory government-issued photo identification requirements. It's come up very briefly, but this is a very important issue that we're mindful of uh, going into November. Indiana has the strictest of such laws. Georgia also has a pretty, uh, pretty tight one. Michigan has put a new law in place. But this has essentially been a movement among um, uh, folks who, who are concerned with voter integrity, uh, more so than voter access, who believe that these laws are necessary to prevent for, uh, voter fraud, who argue that there are uh, you know, people uh, running into the polls on election day, impersonating the dead, uh, uh, finding ways to, to, to cast ballots, cast more than one ballot, and, and mandatory government-issued photo ID laws is the only way to prevent this. The um, evidence shows that vote fraud is a very rare thing, uh, tends not to occur at all, that it's overblown and, and used by these uh, forces to, to justify these laws which uh, uh, impose tremendous burdens, not only on, by minor, on minority voters and poor voters, but on the elderly as well. Uh, government issued ID, we're only talking about passports, driver's licenses in most instances. Um, in Indiana during the uh, primary election this spring, uh, students uh, were, were uh, impacted by these laws because if you go to a private college like Notre Dame, your student ID uh, doesn't, doesn't make the cut, doesn't satisfy the, the, uh, uh, the requirement there. Uh, but elderly voters, many of whom uh, function without uh, driver's licenses, um, may not know where their birth certificate is, may be tremendously burdensome for them to get a hold of their birth certificate from 60, 70, 80 years ago, um, have been significantly impacted um, by these laws. So we're going to be looking very carefully um, to see just how many people are locked out of the process by these laws. And going forward, I think that we need to be mindful of what's happening in our respective state legislatures to make sure they're not jumping on the bandwagon here uh, to adopt uh, a law that has proven to be a tremendous uh, burden for so many voters. I'll, I'll just add one other thing. Uh, Kristen's absolutely right that um, voter ID does have a disproportionate impact on um, older Americans. And, and some of the laws actually do exclude people who are over 65 from their requirements. So um, that's um, helpful to know. But I just wanted to also um, mention issues of accessibility, both of voting machines and of polling places, which um, many um, older Americans are, are more likely to have disabilities um, than um, younger Americans. And we have a real problem nationwide of um, lack of polling place accessibility. So even though each um, state is, uh, I mean, it's actually required by federal law that polling places be accessible. It's required that voting machines be accessible, at least one voting machine be accessible in each polling place, and there's a, a lot of accessibility barriers um, that, that we have not yet removed, even though we have the legal structure in place to do so. Uh, any more questions from our home audience? Yeah, just a question. Um, yes, sir. Uh, I guess it's a question for the uh, Republican Party. Uh, what are the election problems we see show uh, that will be more significant in areas where the Mm -hmm. 
this year we can expect uh, not to happen? I always vote for Florida first. I mean, Florida <laughs> has, uh, I mean, not, not just a history of problems, and it's been ongoing um, since 2000, but it, it is also just has so many more barriers um, to voting than, than any other state. Um, all the, the whole obstacle course I mentioned is all, all present in Florida. Other states have parts of it, and Florida has all of it, and so that is a uh, uh, Florida is always on top of my list, but we're seeing but many of these barriers are cropping up more and more in, in the battleground states, and as the uh, in states where the races are more hotly contested, there are stepped up efforts to try to knock out other voters, and and so we you know you pick a battleground state, you can expect um, problems. I mean Virginia is a, an area where we've been seeing a lot of problems this year as well too three battleground states that have seen a big focus on registering new Latino voters are Nevada, Colorado, and New Mexico. I know in Colorado and Denver, they've been having problems recruiting enough uh, bilingual poll workers. There's already been rumblings of possibly insufficient provision of language assistance. And then in New Mexico, crazy things always happen in New Mexico. And the farther south you get, the weirder things get. So. I'm expecting to see some interesting stuff in those three states because they've been <laughs> such it, uh, under such intense amounts of energy from the campaigns. Um, so it should be interesting there in that part of the Southwest. Yeah. Do you think Help America Act uh, 2002 is sufficient to reform the election? Because uh, I uh, <laughs> wrote a research paper about the election in 2006. And I feel that the 2002 Act is not sufficient to the correct uh, problem for election of uh, 2006. They still have problems in 2006. But there are some more reforms I think required. What do you think? So is HAVA adequate to correct the problem? Um, no, a absolutely not. I mean, HAVA actually, it, HAVA actually created some problems of its own as well, for example, by requiring, you know, in such a short time span, such a massive shift in the technology we use to run elections without sufficient times for um, states to get it right, for these um, machines to be made. But I, I mean, HAVA does address some problems, but a huge number of problems, including problems that predated HAVA, including the butterfly ballot, for example, are, are unaddressed by the Help America Vote Act. So we, we still need to do more. I have uh, several questions uh, here, but, but uh, this one comes from, uh, from Vermont Law School specifically. Uh, people very, very bothered about the Michigan foreclosure uh, instance that you talked about at the very beginning. Can you talk about it for one more minute, Kristen, just what's being done? What are the, what are the sort of constitutional issues they're asking? Uh, you know, how can this be cured? Certainly. So, so how the, the tactic works essentially is uh, we, we understand that uh, the officials in Macomb County intended to obtain foreclosure lists, which would presumably um, bear the names of persons evicted from their homes and, and then and use these lists to challenge somebody's right to cast their ballot. Basically say, uh, this person does not live um, in this precinct because they, they have been evicted from their home. Um, the reason why this is such an illegitimate and troubling practice is, of course, um, a person who face foreclosure may be challenging that foreclosure in the courts, trying to renegotiate with the banks, trying to renegotiate the terms of their subprime mortgage. Uh, you, you know, merely appearing on a foreclosure list isn't uh, enough um, to deny somebody the right to, to cast a, a ballot at, at the place that they show up to on election day. Moreover, a lot of states have laws that do allow voters who may have moved the right to still cast their ballot in their um, prior, prior precincts. So this is a practice that is fraught with problems. It's a heartless tactic. And already there are some signs, particularly out of Indianapolis, of, of other um, groups seeking to adopt similar copycat schemes. But there is actually something that can be done about it, that the, and the secretaries of state in both Michigan and Ohio have already taken steps to issue instructions to local election officials, to poll workers, saying that these, these kinds of challenges must be denied, that in fact it is not lawful to use the mere appearance on a foreclosure list as the sole basis to challenge the eligibility of a voter. And, and this is the kind of advocacy we can do if this shows up in your state. You know, make, make sure that the same, the same ruling is clearly made in your state so that this doesn't end up harming voters. 
Okay. Hello, my name is Cassantia Prier, and I work here at the Program on Law and Government. And I just have a quick question about an email that I've received through my Yahoo account. It warns voters not to show up to the polls wearing any um, T-shirts or clothing that have the presidential candidate's name on it. And I wanted to know how much validity it, um, you know, is, is to that email. And someone and from, uh, let me just say, it, someone from University of Miami just wrote in the same question, so you're, you got the same email, I think. It's decided state by state. Different laws have different rules about what's called electioneering or polling place advocacy. In Texas, you could not wear a button or a T-shirt advocating for a particular candidate um, inside the zone that is drawn around the polling place. Um, so if you're really curious about whether it affects you personally, you can call your Secretary of State or go through your election code. But if you don't care to do the research, then my recommendation would be to wear a different shirt that day. Or when you go and vote, I would tell people, honestly, to vote early if you can, and um, don't wear the shirt then. But then if you want to go around on Election Day and help people and you want to wear a candidate's shirt, then just stay outside the zone from a particular polling place. Or put a sweatshirt on over it. <laughs> we have time for one more question, and I saw a hand. Uh, yeah. Um, I have a question about purges. Um, so one of, one, of the things, one of the things I read yesterday in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution was that um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of people voting early. And, and one of the things they noted sort of at the bottom of the article almost was throwaway was that many, many of the voters Many, many, many voters have protected themselves from being purged simply by voting in the, the voting in the primary elections. And I want to know how, I mean, how true that is, or, or, or to what degree they protect themselves. To have, have, have voters protect themselves in the general election simply by voting in the primary. What, what I think he's referencing, the, the National Voter Registration Act prohibits states from purging anybody from the rolls for failure to vote. Uh, uh, unless two federal election cycles have passed. So if uh, uh, an election official has some reason to believe that uh, you've moved, they've sent you some mail, for example, that has been returned to them off in your place on what's called the inactive list. But just because the mail has bounced back, that is not enough for them to purge you and remove you from the rolls. They have to wait two federal election cycles. And if the voter does not appear to, to, to vote during that course of time, you can be purged. So. Those voters who have voted in a federal election during the, uh, the presidential primary this spring uh, would not be subject to any purging uh, in November. And I, I think that's likely what your, the article that you were reading was talking about, those, those important safeguards that are built into the National Voter Registration Act that limit when and how states purge. And it is important to note the limits of that. It only um, affects um, purges based on um, either you know, uh, inactives or, or changes of address where a, a, a mailing has um, come back, returned, um, and, and the election officials believe you've moved from the election jurisdiction. There are other kinds of purges that those voters could still be caught up in if they're done inaccurately, if they're trying to purge people they believe have died, people that they believe have become convicted of felonies people they believe has been adjudicated mentally incapacitated. So that is, um, it, it certainly protects you from being automatically purged based on the failure to vote, um, but you're, there's still some risk. I think that's our time. I, oh, do you have one more? Go ahead. Know 
We just actually issued a study with the ACLU on that exact question and found that across the country in states that restore voting rights to people with past felony convictions or that actually have a number of crimes, misdemeanors or felonies that are not included in their disenfranchisement laws, there's widespread misinformation among election officials. A third to a half of them don't know the rules. They're misapplying them. And this can obviously be a real problem, can end up leading to disenfranchisement of people who are actually eligible to vote. What we need to do right now is educate both voters and election officials. When we find out that there's particular misinformation being given, we ask them to correct it immediately. And that's something that you all can do as well. If you find out misinformation in your own communities, you should not only notify your election officials, but you should notify, for example, the election protection hotline, which can also take steps to make sure that this is improved on a systematic basis. In Alabama, that's a situation that we've been following very closely at the Legal Defense Fund. There was a local activist who had launched a voter registration drive inside of Alabama state jails aimed to reach persons who were eligible but not yet registered to vote. And Alabama is one state that disqualifies persons convicted of a felony involving moral turpitude. So it doesn't mean that every convicted felon loses their right to vote, only certain ones. So this voter registration drive was very carefully aimed and targeted at persons who retain their right to vote but who are inside of jails and there's no advocate often on behalf of these persons mobilizing them, registering them, getting them absentee ballots. This gentleman, Kenneth Glasgow, was making tremendous headway registering persons inside of jails. The Republican Party got wind of it, complained, said that it appears susceptible to vote fraud. Vote fraud is the catch-all when you want to lock down efforts to improve voter access. And the commissioner of prisons shut the effort down. We filed suit to get Mr. Glasgow's access restored to the state jails to help continue to register persons to vote, and we're hopeful for a helpful outcome. But I'm glad that you raised this issue. State laws vary across the board about the impact of felony convictions on the right to vote. But the fact of the matter is that there are many persons who have been convicted, who have served their time, who have been released, who are not registered and not participating because there is so much misinformation out there. The general myth is that if you've ever been convicted, you lose the right to vote forever, and that's not the case. So I encourage many of you to figure out what the laws are in your respective state. This is an area where we're in dire need of some more real advocacy and efforts to get former felons, ex-felons who are eligible to participate, get their rights restored, and get them access to the political process again. Now we really do have to be done. So I want to thank, first of all, ACS and American University Washington College of Law for putting this on. I want to thank our three astonishing panelists. This was really an incredibly useful and illuminating discussion. And I want to also thank the folks watching out there at George Mason University, Northwestern University, Columbia University, Willamette, Vermont, Franklin Pierce, Wisconsin, Cincinnati, South Texas, Boston College, Michigan State, Oregon, UCLA, Washington and Lee, South Dakota, Georgia, Mississippi, NYU, Pennsylvania, Seattle, and Toledo. That is quite a crowd. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope that each of you is as inspired to get out there and do something on Election Day as I am. So thank you very much for being here, and we'll see you November 4th.
I mean, I'm trying to go. Yeah, I can't. I can go